modeling the data or sort of building up systems to get sort of strange data or difficult manipulations. Um, so I guess I'm sort of here as the on the fence guy and I can talk a little bit about how I made the decision to stay in academia. Perfect, thank you guys. Uh, uh, and we're now live on uh, YouTube as well. Um, I, I'm also a postdoc, as I said, at Max Planck, Florida. My research is vision. And uh, yeah, Matt and I will give the postdoc perspective. Uh, OK, thank you, guys. Uh, Russ and Xiao Zheng, we'd love to hear about your career trajectory and your current research a little more. OK, I'm happy to, uh, to start if you want. So. Um... So I, you know, I did my undergrad at a small university in, in Texas, and I had no training at no classes in cognitive psychology, but somehow decided I wanted to study cognitive psychology, mostly actually from reading philosophy. So I went to grad school, actually started in Illinois, started out doing purely behavioral work, but then um, switched advisors and started doing work on memory systems kind of between healthy and amnesic patients. Um, I've always kind of been a geek as well. I started programming in high school. And so I was drawn to computing and also started doing some modeling and simulation work in graduate school. And um, I, so my, my PhD thesis was supposed to be some work on memory systems. I had planned out a set of experiments and um, about probably four or five months before I was supposed to finish and go start my postdoc, it became clear that those experiments just weren't working. And so, um, I basically was lucky enough to have a PhD thesis committee uh, that was willing to let me take another set of experiments that I've been working on with a, another grad student in the lab and use those as my, uh, my PhD thesis, which was on a, a, another topic around learning and memory, but a very different set of questions. And so, um, so I did that, finished up, and then went to do a postdoc at Stanford. And um, the, I think the theme that I'm going to try to highlight here is, is maybe pivoting, which is that, so I went to Stanford to do, I was focused on doing work with patients. I wanted to study skill acquisition in people with basal ganglia disorders like uh, Parkinson's and Huntington's disease. Mm -hmm. And when I got to Stanford, the access to the patients wasn't quite as good as I had uh, sort of expected. And also this was 1995, fMRI was just becoming like a really hot thing. And so I kind of got sucked into doing fMRI and like, you know, also kind of like the ability to play around with, with bigger, bigger data. So I spent the next four years basically kind of immersing myself in doing fMRI and then um, went on the job market and ended up with a choice between a position in a medical school uh, at uh, Mass General Hospital or a position in a kind of a standard psychology department in the US. Um, you know, people in medical schools are what we call soft money positions, which basically means you have to raise all of your salary off of grants. Whereas in like a psychology department, you know, you usually sort of at least nine months of your salary is paid for by your teaching. Um, I ultimately decided on actually taking the soft money position and going to Mass General. And I was in the, the Martino Center there, you know, which was kind of the birthplace of fMRI. And it was an amazing place to be. Um, but I, you know, I kind of missed being in a psychology department. So after three years there, I decided to move to UCLA uh, to the psychology department, um, spent seven years there, and then um, was recruited to move to UT, University of Texas in Austin um, to basically kind of reboot their imaging center and build a new center on campus. And so uh, spent five years there doing that. And then um, had an opportunity to come back to Stanford. And that was, so I've been at Stanford again now for six years. <laughs> Um, and, you know, one of the things, you know, I've, so that's a lot of moves, right? And I'm, you know, I've been lucky to have a family situation that makes it relatively easy for me to move. Um, and one of the things that I think has been really important about those moves is that, you know, every time I go to a new place, it, you know, you're exposed to new ideas and kind of, uh, and it's inspired new directions in my research. I think it's, you know, if you're in the same place for a really long time, it's easy to kind of get into a conceptual rut. Um, and so, um, so I think I've been lucky to be able to do that. Um, you know, I've also been pushed by things that have happened in the field. Um, so in particular, you know, in the last, probably the last decade, um, my research has become a lot more focused on methodology and also kind of building infrastructure and training, uh, you know, the next generation of researchers to, you know, avoid a lot of the problems with the methods that I grew up using, you know, that, that 
were kind of standard, you know, 10 to 20 years ago. Um, so, so kind of in thinking about, you know, or in talking about why I think I've been successful and, you know, what I might be able to kind of offer others by way of advice, you know, the first thing I have to say up front is that I acknowledge that my success has occurred within a system that's, you know, sexist and racist and, you know, I'm doing everything I can now to work to change that system, but it's impossible to disentangle my success from that system. So I have to acknowledge that up front. Um, so I think, you know, one of the things that I have learned from kind of watching lots of people, you know, go through trying to build careers in science is, you know, obviously raw smarts are important, but I think pretty much everybody who's on this uh, webinar right now has the brains to succeed as a scientist. You know, I think that that nearly all of us can do it. And it's really other things that determine kind of, you know, who goes on and actually succeeds. And, um, you know, many people have said this, right? But I think, you know, the most important aspect of success is luck, right? I was lucky to be in the right place at the right time, just as fMRI was sort of taking off. But I think, you know, luck is as much about what you make it as what actually happens to you, right? So, you know, Pasteur said luck favors the prepared mind. And I think one, you know, one way to think about that is really about um, flexibility, right? So I think that being able to kind of, you know, see that things are changing in the world or things have not worked out in the way that you thought they might have. And my, my PhD advisor, Neil Cohen, had this great saying, um, snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. Um, and I think, you know, being able to kind of, you know, see when things aren't going right and kind of, you know, find new opportunities in that, I think is an important, uh, an important aspect of being able to be successful. Obviously, you know, another thing that's really important is just working really hard. You know, I think the, the, you know, the people who are successful at anything, right, are people who are sort of obsessed at becoming the best that they can be at that thing, but, you know, regardless of whether it's, you know, playing the flute or being a scientist or whatever else it is that you want to be good at. Um, the, you know, I know that there's, there's a lot of discussion of, of, you know, work-life balance. To be honest, that idea has never really made any sense to me because I don't really consider what I do to be work. To me, it's, you know, it's a gift to be able to spend my life asking questions about how the world works. And if I could do it 25 hours a day for the rest of my life, I would. Um, that's not to say there aren't parts of it that I don't love, um, but the amazing parts of it, you know, have kind of, you know, made up for those, uh, you know, many times over. So I've never been particularly strategic about, you know, what I study or how I do it. I've kind of just followed my nose towards questions that I thought were important and kind of, you know, went after them as hard as I could and sort of trusted that I would land on my feet. And obviously that, you know, that trust comes in part from a place of privilege. So I, you know, I hope that all of you who are who are listening have can have some of that you know same confidence as you go forward in your careers and i'm happy to come back later and discuss any of these points thanks thank you before we move on to xiao jen can you comment a bit about how uh covid19 has impacted your lab um yeah so you know my lab a lot of the people in my lab already, you know, worked remotely because we have a lot of, we have several software developers. Um, we, you know, um, we, we don't collect that much data in my lab, but we do collect some data. And, and obviously that has been on hold for a number of months. And that's, you know, we're fortunately, we had a backlog of data that we could spend analyzing. And so that's what we've been doing. But, you know, if we can't start collecting data soon, it's become, it's going to become a serious impediment for, the people in my lab who rely on new data collection. But I think like, you know, like I said, we were in a pretty good position already. And it, it really highlights the degree to which, you know, if one can have your, you know, if you can have an alternative source of data or have, you know, computational work that you can do, that's a, I think that's a good pivot in the face of this kind of a, a outcome. Thank you. Ross Xiaojiang. All right. So, um... Let's see, so I did my undergraduate and PhD in physics in uh, Belgium. Um, and then I came to this country to look for a postdoc job. Um, so I kind of used to joke that in a single day, uh, three things happened to me. Uh, I changed my field from physics to computational science. I changed the language from French to English. 
and now of course changes the culture, uh, you know, once again, when I arrived in the US. Um, I was also lucky a bit like what Ross was saying, uh, back then computational science was just getting launched. Uh, you know, if you want, of course there are always pioneers, right, before the field actually uh, takes off. But if you want to say which year you can say that the condition of neuroscience really got started kind of officially, I would say, you know, 1988 would be a good, you know, uh, time mark because uh, at that time there was a kind of manifesto piece in science, uh, you know, published promoting this new field and the first the summer school in Woods Hall uh, was uh, started. Uh, in the same year. So I was lucky uh, in, on that front as well. The other thing is uh, a bit related to how you choose the topic or the field, uh, you know, uh, in the field. Uh, I was also lucky on that regard. Uh, you know, back then, actually, uh, rigorous uh, neurophysiological studies of cognitive functions were very rare. It existed at all, right? People kind of focused on, uh, you know, coding in sensory neurons or central pattern generators in insects, those kind of problems. Uh, I was lucky to just have a chance uh, encounter with a psychiatrist and anatomist uh, who kind of, you know, told me about the prefrontal cortex in primates. I was just, uh, you know, very um, interested in this uh, incredibly mysterious uh, structure that analyzed so many interesting, um, you know, functions and even mental life, you could say. Um, so that really is how um, I got into interested in understanding, um, you know, a system like PFC and at the same time being a physicist trying to, right, find a relatively simple problem that we can, as a physicist, can even handle, so to speak, right? And, and you know, working memory would be a good example because it's almost the same as a primary visual cortex, if you like, but the, 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 the added challenge is to understand how a circuit can uh, actually hold internally, uh, you know, a piece of information in the absence of external stimulation. Okay. So that, you know, led me to uh, spend a lot of um, time and efforts trying to think about a, a working memory circuit, which um, frankly, um, uh, quite surprisingly, uh, the kind of model that we build for working memory uh, turned out to be exactly the same way you want uh, to look at to understand decision making. Uh, so, uh, um, you know, you're not sure that's how uh, research in my group has been for a long time focused on working memory and decision making. Um, I guess um, the other thing that was also um, not really planned is that it's really the same brain circuits, right? Like prefrontal cortex that are implicated in psychiatric disorders. So if you make some progress, you know, in understanding those kind of circuits, then you can start to try to connect with, uh, you know, clinical studies. And that's how we also got into collaborating with, uh, you know, clinical people. And uh, now there's this nascent field called the computational psychiatry. Um, so, you know, yeah, uh, I guess, uh, you know, luck certainly played a role. Uh, I guess I can add that uh, in my experience, it's kind of more fun if you just have, have this opportunity to be in a new field, right? Uh, I like to say to people in my lab that I really believe this, you know, you, the same kind of amount of efforts um, is needed when you make a real big difference in a totally new field or trying to keep working on the same boring problem. <laughs> uh, I hope this makes sense to, to some of you or reason, resonate with you, right? So, I mean, how do you do that? Of course, luck is part of it. I guess the other one is just, uh, I guess uh, this, we need a combination of being somewhat the uh, rest of this, right? They're really be curious, interested in, you know, thinking about uh, different kind of problems, but of course, at the same time, be rigorous, be persistent, um, you know, um, not jumping around too much, right? So that's, that's the balance. And, um, you know, I guess, um, 
uh, as a way, you know, because I was thinking about, I guess most of people are young, uh, graduates and postdocs in the schools. Uh, so I guess uh, I would uh, want to say, and I believe that, right, uh, today, when you really think about your career in academia, uh, I just want to kind of put in my two cents that uh, um, really most of what we know in computational neuroscience, maybe in neuroscience as well, in general, are local circuits. You know, how one particular brain area is somehow involved or dedicated to a particular function. Uh, but we also know from studies in particular by imaging, you know, Ross and others, that we know that most of these functions are not localized, right? It's kind of distributed across multiple brain regions. Up to today, we didn't have tools to really look at that. Only now, I think, we have the technology, such as neuron pixel, if you heard about it, to record from thousands of neurons from multiple brain regions in animals doing cognitive tasks, like working memory or decision making, um, you know, and kind of atomics data. Um, now we are really, uh, I think, uh, I believe that we are really, uh, you know, at the edge of opening this area of rigorously studying multi-regional large-scale brain systems. Of course, that allows us also to connect with the imaging world, uh, with you know human studies, uh, and we, I think, um, uh, can do a lot more new interesting things in computational neuroscience. In, in computational neuroscience in so in practice, um, I really, I just say a couple of things uh, I hope are relevant to, uh, you know, participants of this course. Uh, maybe I should mention that in my mind, uh, you know, I watch how the field evolved over the last three decades or so. Uh, you know, certain things really made big differences for the field and for young people back then, I was one of you, you know, like today. Uh, why is uh, you know those uh, theoretical neuroscience centers? Uh, there was a few centers established um, long ago by Sloan Foundation, and now there are some centers uh, supported by Swartz Foundation. And there are other centers. There's a new one in Chicago, for example, uh, that's uh, going to be launched very quickly. Right. So those centers are designed for theorists to. Uh, um, have the opportunity to flourish, but also to interact with experimentalists. Uh, and, you know, other things are like some schools, etc. I think are now in place uh, for, for you to uh, really get into the field. Thanks. And on your point about um, treating the brain sort of without borders, um, at NMA we have student projects and um, a lot of the staff spent time curating the NeuroPixels data set from the Steinmetz data, the Stringer data set from that paper, and they've made that available to students um, so they can sort of start to look at this whole brain approach. We've talked about dimensionality re reduction. Um, we haven't yet had a conversation about the scientific framework. Uh, but but that's an interesting line of research. Yeah, um, just to say one more time, uh, without being repetitive, yeah. it's really new. You know, you are yeah. really lucky to be, you know, get into the field at this moment. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, can you comment about how the pandemic has affected your lab? Yeah. So you know, supposedly we have a computational lab. So when you know we're going to do well lab experiments, uh, uh, and supposedly we are you know minimally affected. But I have to say, I'm sure we are affected in, in multiple ways. Uh, you know, it's just very stressful for many people in the lab. Uh, I know a, one of uh, my postdocs uh, has only a studio, a small studio with a young child, right? How can you have you know, a small studio, one room, uh, basically for the whole family while trying to uh, do research, right? Uh, and you know, and there are also psychological impacts. I'm sure if you feel like isolated, not to mention some other challenges, right? So you know, this days, you when you look back, right, year 2020 is really, you could say a year of horror. You know, there's so many you know stressful, challenging things going on. So I think we should be really all aware of this, you know, uh, and try to support each other. 
Um, this is most, I would say for computational people, it's mostly psychological. Um, I might as well mention, right, uh, not surprisingly, some many labs have foreign uh, researchers, right, and they're worried about things like the visa. Um, so, you know, there's a combination of all these things combined, because, you know, on top of a pandemic, which is horrible, um, very, very stressful, um, I think, psychologically for people. Thank you. Try, you know, we try to say that we, we, we try to address that, right? We have yeah. a weekly uh, lab meeting, but kind of a virtual happy hour, and people make sure that we all keep being connected and communicative if somebody, you know, wants to talk to somebody else, you know, and so make sure that this really is, uh, you know, there's a supporting, uh, you know, uh, mechanism in the framework. Matt, I think you and I are uh, on the more com uh, on the more experimental side of things, and I know that um, the way my work has been impacted is that I I can't see my behavior animals as much, and and that impacts the experiments. I can't do as many experiments. Um, can you comment on how things have affected your experimental work? Yeah, we're in a very similar boat. Um, so I work mostly with awake behaving animals and they haven't been well they've been awake but they haven't been behaving since since february uh covid got off to a really sort of aggressive start here so uh yeah they've gotten very fat very lazy and uh you know it's going to be a long haul to get them sort of back into shape i got lucky in that we had we were sort of wrapping up a project when things hit so i've actually gotten a paper accepted and another one sort of started but yeah the the data well for me has run dry so i'm, I'm really looking forward to getting back in the lab <laughs> Same. Uh, okay, thank you guys. Uh, we have a lot of questions piling up, so I think we should go directly to that one. And I'll start with the second top voted question from Josh. I think this is communicating um, what a lot of postdocs and grad students are feeling. Will the current COVID situation increase the pool of people applying for postdoc and professor track positions in not just this fall, but in the coming years? And will this make it even more difficult to get positions. So, um, in neuroscience or computation neuroscience? Both. Uh, Russ, go ahead. Um, I mean, I think that the big challenge, you know, it may well, I, I think that the pool is going to increase simply because the number of positions is almost certainly going to get smaller. I mean, you know, a lot of universities are, you know, Stanford amongst them are going to have serious financial problems over the next few years. You know, it's unlikely that we're going to be hiring any new faculty for at least a couple of years. And, and we're in a, a really good position compared to a lot of other universities, right? Because we have an endowment. Um, so I think that the number of faculty positions is going to really slow down. And, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people talking about how, you know, this could just completely change the landscape of higher education altogether and really, you know, reduce the number of universities. And that, you know, that also hurts the, the number of positions and increases the competitiveness. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's just impossible to, um, to avoid thinking that, you know, it's going to be really challenging. And I think that really highlights the need to, um, you know, to figure out what you can do in graduate school to, you know, prepare yourself for, um, you know, the potential for those academic positions to not be there and to have the best chance of being able to, uh, you know, to, to go find a non-academic position. Um, so I guess I would just add two things. One is uh, depending on your time, you know, horizon. Uh, I agree that, uh, you know, short term, I'm sure this pandemic is affecting hugely on universities. Uh, but longer term, uh, it's clear that uh, uh, there is more awareness that the computational science is really important in neuroscience. Uh, just now, the second phase of the U.S. Brain Initiative uh, started. If I encourage you to take a look on the white paper, um, you know this second phase, uh, and it states very, you know, emphasizes very strongly theoretical neuroscience as you know, playing increasingly important role. 
And again, different universities like Chicago uh, decided that not only they want to hire one theorist, but they need to hire a cluster of computational neuroscientists at each uh, you know, institution. So longer term, I'm quite optimistic that the field uh, really will uh, continue to grow. Uh, the second thing I want to add is, um, uh, you know, I certainly am not uh, um, being negative about uh, going seeking no academic jobs. Uh, and uh, I think the great thing about our field is that in fact, you know, the skills you learn are very much, you know, uh, welcomed and uh, seeked after uh, in industry. Uh, but I just want to say that um, if you really are curious, uh, um, I'm concerned that too many talents are drawn to AI industry. Uh, so I hope that the very good ones will still stay in academia. Matt, do you want to chime in here? Um, no, I mean, <laughs> no, you don't this may to. be a good segue for some of the, so there are a lot of questions about transitioning and sort of hedging your bets. And so that's, that's pretty much what I've been doing, um, even sort of before the COVID. Uh, you know, I, I would very much like to run my own lab, um, but there are lots of ways to sort of transition to something kind of like that in an industry setting. So someone asked about sort of mixed industry and academic postdocs. And one of the things that I think has worked out really nicely for me in my postdoc is we had a collaboration with, uh, with um, HRL labs in California. So I got a lot of exposure to people in industry. I got, you know, so I, I have hopefully some contacts there if I decide that's something I want to do. But I think this is a, definitely a thing you should keep in mind as you, as you sort of plan out your ac academic career. Like if you can get next to something that would be a good fallback or plan B or plan A, uh, you should do that. Agreed, um, yeah. Just to uh, maybe that, you know, places, there are not many, but the places uh, like the Allen Institute, in a way, it's a bit of a hybrid, right? Uh, uh, you can consider. Um, so I'm, I'm still going to go uh, for the job market, too. It will be more competitive. Um, and, you know, I've had this uh, attitude that things are going to work out. There's definitely luck involved. There's definitely perseverance involved. And I think that's still the case, but I do think it's gonna be a little harder for the next couple of years. But well, that's uh, kind of everyone's situation right now. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Uh, it's the most top voted and it's Alexandra's asking, any advice for upcoming female scientists? I do appreciate the race issue by Russ regarding the privilege still present. So um, I'll start. Uh, by answering that. I, it's, it's a little bit of a tough issue because uh, it is still a male dominated field, uh, but you have to advocate for yourself and you have to be sort of present and take up space and find supportive allies. I have a really supportive um, PI, David Fitzpatrick. He's been uh, really sort of advocating for me, but I, I realize that I also have to do that for myself. Uh, but I would like you guys to also answer that you have um, female colleagues, you have female postdocs and trainees that you've trained. So this is also a very relevant question for you guys. So, I mean, one thing I might add is, you know, just being like uh, really on top of looking for mentorship, especially, you know, it's like we often think of mentorship as like something that happens when you're a grad student or a postdoc and then you become a faculty and suddenly you're an adult and you never have to ask anybody for advice again. You know, I still go to my senior colleagues and ask for advice. And I think, you know, for um, for women in academia, finding, you know, obviously to the degree that there are senior women that you can get advice from, I think that's really important. But I think also, you know, senior men also have something to offer, especially those who have shown themselves to be allies. So I think, you know, I think it's important for everybody to realize that, you know, mentorship is something that happens through your entire career. But, you know, there's rarely are you encountering a problem that hasn't been encountered by you know your senior colleagues before and so i think you know kind of start if you if you're starting out as a as a faculty member really finding you know multiple colleague multiple senior colleagues who you can go to for advice i think is really important um maybe i can mention that um there is a, a piece that's under consideration at neuron about this 
uh, and you know, during this involves many people. So it's very clear that this is a still a very prominent issue, uh, a big issue, uh, you know, for the field about neuroscience. Because in computational neuroscience, you could say it's even potentially worse, just right because somehow there's this uh, bias perception that uh, you know uh, math related you know fields tend to uh, have underrepresentation by women, which is the reality. Sorry, not the perception, but the reality. Um, you know, that we all, you know, of course, aware of this, and um, um, it, it, uh, question is what, how, what we can do together as a community to keep working on this and help, uh, you know, support uh, female uh, computational neuroscientists uh, in particular. Right, for our field. Um, I, I maybe still want to say something that's really quite positive, right? So we are making efforts. I can just mention one example. Like I'm involved in two summer schools. We put in tremendous time and efforts to invite, uh, uh, you know, female speak lecturers and to make sure that the student body is uh, gender balanced. And I, I also am a co-director of a, a training program at NYU in computational science that involves uh, six undergraduates and uh, five graduate student supports. Throughout the years, actually, we have 50-50, uh, you know, uh, men and women. So if we make efforts, it's, it's not impossible. Um, I, you know, I'll just add, I think that that raises a really important point with, you know, for the men, for everybody, you know, in, in the audience, but especially for the men, which is just to be, you know, whenever you're involved in an organization or a meeting or anything like that, to just, you know, have this issue of, you know, fairness um, and balance at the top of your list of priorities, right? Because it's very easy for it to, for people to realize, oh, hey, we put together a meeting and we've got, you know, 12 white men talking um, and, you know, that you shouldn't get to that point. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, I'm a minority woman and I forget all the time. I actively have to remember it. And especially if there are multiple people involved in an organization, it can very easily not come up until you sort of see the whole, uh, absolutely. And I just wanna add um, about Russ's point on finding senior woman mentors. I would love a senior woman mentor. They are very busy. They are, you know, they often have more responsibilities uh, academically and at home. But I've, uh, I've found great male mentors and, you know, maybe their advice isn't um, quite as sympathetic and, or um, they can't empathize in the same ways, but they still have and um, continue to provide excellent support in that way too. Okay, great. Uh, let's move on to the next question. There's kind of a couple of questions in the vein of transmission. Uh, transition between academia and industry within academia between different fields. So I'll read Dante's question, uh, but you guys can sort of address this more broadly. Yesterday we heard of people going from academia to industry. Has any one of you gone or know people who have gone from industry back to academia? And if you can um, point out what that experience was like. Xiaoxing, do you know of anyone who's done that successfully? I just think maybe I don't. I don't see a you know no I I don't think so. But uh, I I do see a way for people who are in the industry, you know, places like say Google Brain, uh, who really kind of miss uh, academia, uh, and then one way depends on your goal, right? So. Um, if you kind of miss academia and want to have a continued, uh, you know, um, involvement, participation, contribution at a, uh, you know, academic institution, you can easily establish collaborations, right? So you can say, oh, it, it's good for me to spend a day every week at MIT, for example, if you're in Boston area, 
uh, because what I do actually is very interesting, you know, related to what these guys uh, are doing at MIT. And those kind of things are, are I think, a good arrangement if, you know, that meets your goal. Yeah, I mean, I think the most important thing is just to, you know, if, if one has that goal in mind to make sure that whatever industry position you end up in is one where you can still, you know, um, participate in publication and in conferences and all the things that are going to be important for, you know, for judgment as a candidate for an academic position. It's, it's definitely challenging. I see in the, the comments, people are talking about a couple of, uh, of, of individuals who've done it, but um, I mean, it used to, it's funny, it used to be really common, like people, you know, like there's a bunch of people who worked at like Bell Labs and other places like that back, you know, a couple of decades ago who easily made the transition. Um, it doesn't seem as common anymore, but um, but certainly I think it's, it's you know, possible if you make sure. So I, I could see like somebody working at, you know, DeepMind or Google Brain, they're obviously they're publishing a lot. They, you know, it, I could imagine them making that transition, you know, relatively straightforwardly. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually surprised to hear that you, you uh, don't know anyone. Uh, so my wife's PhD advisor moved from uh, academic research to Biogen and back. Uh, I think Brad Wojtek was at Uber for a while. Um, I think it's definitely doable. But yeah, the problem is that if you're out for a long time, you'll sort of lose the publications and it would be hard to get back in as faculty. Um, I think it's more doable than we've sort of implied, but you, do, you would have to be very strategic about it. Matt, um, can you address Jim Lee's question? Are there uh, postdocs sure. that are both in academia and industry? Um, yes. So in Canada has a program called MyTax, uh, which is explicitly set up to encourage that. So the idea is that you work um, on a problem that has some sort of industrial application and also uh, basic research. And so there you, you, you get funding, you actually get quite a bit of funding. And you're, you're explicitly split between the two. So you're supposed to spend a certain amount of time at the company, a certain amount of time um, in, in the university lab. Uh, we have a couple people doing that and they range from like, you know, I'm, I'm modeling something, I'm gonna use the model in two different ways uh, to experimentalists who are like building a thing which they will use in their own lab and also sell. Uh, more sort of vaguely, I think you could also find a lab that's involved in industrial collaborations and you know you wouldn't be explicitly split, but you'd have a lot of opportunities to move back and forth. Um, when I was a grad student, I knew someone who worked in a in a microscopy lab um, with Larry Cohen, and yeah, so he, he got to do some sort of industry type stuff, building the microscope, and then he would go back to the lab and use it. But that was all sort of informally arranged. I think, yeah, and then you know there are DeepMind and programs like that that are sort of academic-y. You'd have to be very intentional about finding that. I think if you showed up in a random lab and were like, I want to do this, the reception would vary. But uh, I mean, particularly in Canada, if you get the MyTax money, you know, everybody likes money. Uh, so Dante is asking if you can type into the, to the chat, the MyTax uh, program, I guess. Our, Patrick is on it. It says it's called MyTax. Oh, okay, it's great. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, and I do know, I have a couple of friends who postdoc I guess, at the Allen Institute and found their way back into tenure track positions. You do have to be cognizant of that and make a plan to publish first author papers, but they managed to negotiate that just fine. Um, Pfizer had a program too that was meant for you to just spend two years in industry and then go back. So you were sort of shunted towards publication friendly things, which I think means away from drugs that actually work. But uh, Okay, let's go to Miriam's question. This is a pivot um, a little way into research and funding. How much do you actively think about fundability of your research when deciding on your research path or individual studies? And Russ, if you would mind addressing that first. Yeah, um, I mean, I, you know, I wouldn't say that I, when I'm trying to come up with questions to ask, I'm not thinking about fundability. Um, you know, I, because usually these questions just, you know, kind of pop out of a, a hole that I see in a literature or, you know, something that I think people like something like a, a thing that isn't being asked that I think is like, you know, important. Um, having said that, you know, we've, the, the, the strategy that I've taken, like I, my lab is actually like in the last probably 15 years, I think we've gotten one. So at the NIH, they have what are called investigator-initiated grants, which is like, I have an idea, I'm gonna send in a grant, 
that could be on anything, right? And it goes to a relatively general uh, review panel and they review it. We've, we've gotten one of those funded. And in general, the, you know, the funding rates on those are pretty low. We've done much better at getting funding from more targeted opportunities. So for example, we've gotten a couple of grants in the last decade from a particular program at NIH called the Science of Behavior Change Program. And basically, you know, we saw that NIH was interested in a particular question. It was relevant to something that we were already working on, but we figured out basically how to, you know, frame the questions that we want to ask in the context of the questions that that program wanted to fund research on. Um, and, and I've found those kinds of opportunities to be uh, much more successful than just kind of throwing a grant into a big pile and, and seeing what sticks. So it hasn't been, the fundability wasn't, you know, wasn't on our minds when we started asking the question, but then we tried to ask, how can we take the question we're already asking and kind of, uh, you know, push it a little bit in the direction of the particular funding priorities of the, the um, agency. So I guess I want to say, you know, uh, something about computational scientists, uh, how we, you know, should think about funding support. Um, these days there are all kinds of mechanisms, you know, including the so-called CRCNS program that has really made, a, I think, a, a very good impact in the field that because it's kind of specially designed for collaborations between experimentalists and the theorists. Um, I guess the main thing I want to convey, uh, you know, you are young PI, or you will about becoming young PI, is that um, on one hand, right, we, you know, we in a way serve as a glue uh, for all kinds of experiments. Uh, so it's very natural that we collaborate with many people Right, people may come to you, uh, either for data analysis or build a model, and it's wonderful, right? So we, we serve this role um, as a glue for you know experimentalists, if you want, right? But at the same time, uh, you also, of course, should also kind of create your own path, right? In the end, uh, you should be somehow, you know, feeling that you are recognized. Uh, you know, for something that you did, right? So there's this, uh, you know, both sides. I mentioned this in the context of grants because, um, you know, right? So if your grants are all can join grants with experimentalists, which again are wonderful, nothing wrong about it. Uh, but then how do you take care of the second part, right? How do you really establish yourself as a leader on some topic uh, of your own. So that, that just, uh, I think, is advice that uh, it's useful to keep in mind. Thank you, guys. Um, this is this next question is related to our previous conversation about industry positions, academic positions. Um, so I can find tenure track position um, notices easily. I can find industry positions easily but the soft money positions or the staff scientist positions, those are few and far in between and also hard to find. So Xiao Jing and Russ, do you guys have ideas here? Where do people post those? Should you be reaching out to directors and PIs? So soft faculty positions, soft money? Yes. Uh, yeah. So, I, well, uh, we can ask Miriam to clarify I'm, I'm asking specifically for staff scientist positions. Um, yeah. Research staff positions are often advertised by departments, but, but the sort of soft money, permanent research positions are harder to find. I yeah, think that's that, what Miriam is asking. Yeah, frankly, you know, I, I spent 80 years in Europe and I have a lot of connections in Europe. So I want to mention that this is something in my view is not necessarily optimal in the US, right? Uh, of course, the U.S. research system is really top-notch, and there's a reason that uh, you know people stay in the lab for a few years and then you know, move on. Uh, that really encourages uh, innovation, new ideas, and, and that's you know no question about that. I mean, that's I think one of the strengths of the U.S. system. At the same time, uh, nothing is perfect, I would say, right? So 
So it's more uh, common in a European system to see somebody who's, you know, is on the staff, not a PI, but on the staff, very good scientist, but on the staff, you know, for a long, long time. And we don't really have that. Uh, and that's not necessarily always good, I think, right? Um, how to find those positions, uh, I'm actually not so sure. Uh, you know, what are the ways, except maybe through informal you know, inquiries. So um, I'll say a couple things about that. One is I think, yeah, that often, well, one thing to say is that, you know, often when you see an ad for a, you know, research scientist sort of position, in a lot of cases, that position is already filled and they're just putting the ad out basically because they legally have to, you know, the position has to be mm -hmm. advertised. So before they can give it to the internal candidate, I think very often these kind of positions are going to someone who is already part of that institution and they just want to move them up. And that's in general, in, in medical schools, these kind of soft money positions often, you know, somebody shows up as a postdoc and then they kind of get transitioned into one of these kind of like, you know, soft money assistant professor sorts of positions. So, um, so I think, you know, th there's, there's no alternative to talking to people. Like if there's a, if there's a particular department you're interested in, then, you know, find, you know, either get in touch with someone there or preferably probably find someone, you know, who has a personal connection to someone there, because I think that, you know, it's, like cold calls, just like, you know, sort of contacting somebody, a busy person who doesn't know you, it's probably pretty unlikely for that to work out unless, you know, you really fit. Uh, I mean, I think one important thing is like figuring out what's the niche that you would fit in that group, right? Is it a group that's working on questions that are relevant to what you do, but you think you could bring something important? I think, you know, you really have to, as a candidate for that kind of position, you really have to kind of sell yourself as fitting into, you know, in a complimentary way to what they're already doing. But I think, yeah, those, it's really hard to find kind of, um, kind of, you know, in, at least in university, I see there's some comments about NIH and I agree that NIH staff scientists are positions there. There's not that many of them, you know, they're, but, um, but those are advertised more broadly, but I think, you know, get having connections and, and finding some way to talk to people directly is probably the best way to go. So if you are already kind of sending a postdoc in a place that you want to stay, there is a mechanism, right? You can become what's called a, a social, uh, research assistant professor. And that uh, happens actually not so rarely. You should explore that. Uh, that's kind of soft money, but then your faculty, uh, you know, yeah, that, Russ's point is very true. I got really excited about a job position, and it turned out to be my own position that was getting posted to renew my work <laughs> permit. <laughs> I was like, this is exactly me. And at the bottom, it turned out that it was. Mm. Um, it also depends a lot on the country. So Canada has a weird sort of vendetta against soft money coming from Canadian sources. Mm. Um, so you can't pay yourself out of your own grant. Um, however, I think one thing that seems to work is if you look for labs that have just gotten large grants, especially from DARPA, where they have very fixed and kind of insane timelines, those labs will have a lot of money, which they can spend on a staff scientist, and they need to someone who can hit the ground running fairly quickly. So uh, we picked up somebody kind of like that, um, because otherwise we were going to lose the whole contract. <laughs> the flip side being that money can go away very quickly as well, right? Oh, those three years aged me like 10 years, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, I can't really answer this question, but hopefully one of you guys can. Any advice information on opportunities for scienti scientists and public policy, especially given the current American administration? Malka is asking this. Vote, please vote. <laughs> yeah, but also actually there are ways, there are actually multiple mechanisms. I think um, many, well, a number of foundations or academies, academics support the fellowships, right? You can uh, actually apply to a fellowship if you get it. You say spend a, a year in the Congress. You get to learn about the politics, get to learn about the policies, and you really, um, I think, you know, it's a wonderful opportunity to uh, to know the you know whole system, and then you can go from there. Uh, 
there are also other ways if you are more thinking about it, like having a, a career as a writer in science, that's also tremendously important for the field. Um, I just Let's pasted just a link, a link. To... Oh. Sorry. <laughs> No, go ahead. I was advertising your link. Okay. Yeah. I just pasted a link to this uh, program that the American Association for the Advancement of Science has the Science and Technology Policy Fellowship. And I've known a couple of people who've done this. And I think it's a really great program for people who, you know, people, I know people who've done it as grad students or postdocs who spend, I can't remember how long it is, some amount of time. Is it a year? I think um, it's a year. Basically working in Washington, like learning how uh, policy. Uh, learning how to interface with policy as a scientist, learning to talk to Congress people and so on. Obviously, this is not a great time for, uh, you know, the science policy interface, um, but, you know, fingers are crossed that in uh, January uh, that changes. I have two friends who did the AAAS program and they loved it. So if this is a thing you're, you're really serious about, um, get in touch with me. I'll introduce you to, to Emily and uh, she can rave about it for several hours. Great, and people can get in touch with Matt on Neurostars, right? You're yes. on there? Great. Uh, okay, we're just about out of time. I'll relay Yulia's last question and sort of append my own a little bit. Her question is, have you ever regretted not having moved into industry? And I'll add on, what do you love about being professors and postdocs in academia? Freedom. <laughs> That's me, exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> As, you know, I think Ross said at the very beginning, you know, it's, it's not a job, right? It's not a work. It's really something you are lucky to do, uh, you know, uh, for joy. Because in spite of everything else, you know, um, that's really the main thing that uh, keeps us, uh, make us a kick. I have not regretted uh, what I've done. Obviously, you know, the, the opportunities for going into industry were much fewer back in the day when I was, uh, you know, a grad student or a postdoc. Um, but, uh, but no, I'm, I'm super happy with what I do. Right. And, and we have had balanced viewpoints. We had um, two, actually three or four industry sessions yesterday and we heard from people that were very happy um, having transitioned to industry so everybody just has to find what's right for them uh, and what's right for them given the current pandemic some people can't wait it out some people can and will try can i throw in a, a little bit of advice so when i finished grad school my phd time was a little rocky and i wasn't sure what i wanted to do so i interviewed everywhere i went to um so obviously postdoc interviews, which is how I ended up here, but uh, tech industry, little startups, giant companies. I even went to a hedge, uh, government job, uh, a hedge fund. Like, especially when you're finishing your PhD, you have a lot of flexibility to just go places and say like, I'm, I finished this big milestone. I want to do something new. And I think you should do it if you can, unless you're like 110% set on a particular path, just go for a few of every interview. They'll buy you lunch. Uh, I got to visit San Diego, actually, which was awesome. The interview was terrible, but San Diego was awesome. Uh, just It wasn't in Russ's lab, it was at a company. Uh, just go everywhere, see what you like. And I have somewhere a giant Google Doc that I made for me called The Great Escape. And I sort of weighed up all the pros and cons. And I decided that I wanted to do a postdoc. You know, industry is not going anywhere, especially the big tech companies. They've just gotten richer and richer. So, you know. Check everything out, make a decision that, that works for you, and uh, take it from there. OK, uh, thanks, everyone, for giving your perspective. Um, does anyone want to end with one sentence of advice? And then, and then we'll close the session. I just want to thank you, uh, Marina. Uh, for organizing this, and um, uh, everybody will continue to enjoy uh, the Nash Academy. Thank you. Yeah, likewise. Thanks very much. And uh, you know, anybody who has questions, should feel free to ping me. You know, on any of the social media.
that I'm okay great thank you someone in the chat Vikram is asking for further further advice yes all right if that's it uh thank you guys all for joining us thanks everybody in the audience and we're done thank bye you. everyone bye all bye, bye. good to see you <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>